So, um, hi everyone, and, and I'll repeat into the mic, um, happy International Women's Day. Let's hear some applause. Yeah, there we go. Um, I want to thank the um, Women in Design team, um, Alex Zibo, um, Kaden Zaini Abu Arya, and I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, and Cheryl Lynn. Um, it's, a, I think, a, a really important organization that's had a big impact on the school, um, and I appreciate your organization of events all week, including the lecture last night. Um, and um, I, I want to also acknowledge, of course, that we're on the land of the Massachusetts people. Um, I think everyone in this room knows that. But I think it's still important for us to pause and acknowledge that we're on the land of a, a tribe that had been here long before any of us, um, and that we acknowledge that uh, the Massachusetts people hold land in high regard, and that we respect the Massachusetts people past, present, and future. Um, and and uh, and yeah, I mean, I think that land is actually something that is part of our whole school, part of what we all do. And so acknowledging that land comes with conflict, it comes with histories, is an important thing to do um, at all times. We have live captioning available. I think if you're on Zoom, that's on the, the screen. There's a little button at the bottom for closed caption. And here, if you need captions, you can put your phone up and it will magically give you the QR code, will take you somewhere. I'm always amazed by that, but I'm still a little bit new to QR codes. Um, there's also a link for those of us who are a little more old fashioned. So you can, you can get um, live captioning if you want. Um, so I, um, I'm, I'm going to be introducing Malkit. Malkit will then introduce the second speaker, and then there will be a panel at the end where Alex will come up and, and moderate that, if I understand correctly. So um, this is the second time in seven days, I think, that I'm introducing Malkit. And, and I'm actually going to lean somewhat on that previous introduction. So Malkit is, for us this year, the Senior Loeb Scholar. Um, and um, that, is, uh, that is our effort to have Malkit essentially guide us through a series of conversations across the school on the topic of spaces of conflict and how one actually can articulate uh, what that means for, for all of us. How, how do you engage in conversations um, about sites that are sites of conflict? How do you... Um, even start the conversation, let alone the design, within contested territories. So again, returning to the fact that we're on a, a site that historically was contested, I think is, is valuable. So um, Melkit is no stranger to the GSD. Melkit has been teaching here longer than I've been dean. Um, she was head of the art, design, and public domain area of the MDES and is currently a design critic in the urban planning and design um, department here at the GSD. She teaches, this semester, she's teaching a UPD seminar on uh, spatial design strategies for climate migration, as well as an MDES open project. She's sort of the model of the open projects. When we were creating that as a new pedagogy, she was one of the people we were sort of imagining, and I've been very happy that she has been teaching the open project in, in MDES. That open project is entitled Forms of Assembly, All Things Considered. She's the founder and director of the architectural think tank FAST, Foundation for Achieving Seamless Territory. Um, but I will note that she operates at many speeds, um, and I think that's actually part of her practice, is um, uh, understanding that even though she's called FAST, she's not always speedy. Um, she curated the Love in the Mist, The Politics of Fertility, which was an exhibit that was here in fall of 2019, um, uh, and was sort of incredibly timely if you think of the um, Supreme Court Dobbs decision that happened after that. So Malkit uses spatial design tools to make visible um, systemic violence 
to engage with various publics to co-design alternatives that center social and environmental justice and to advocate for systemic change. So it's a pretty heady agenda that she has on her back um, that she advocates for. I think that she offers an incredible model of practice um, for all of us. Um, and I, I am very grateful to her for being the senior lobe this year, but also for bringing her practice to us in many ways, including in this forum. So I will hand over the microphone to Malkit, but thank you very much for doing this for us. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Or, yeah. It's, I'll say it's still morning for me. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm really excited to be here and uh, be in conversation with women in design. Thank, thank you, Sarah, for the um, uh, invitation to be the senior lab sc uh, scholar this year. And uh, I'm very excited to celebrate with you the International Women Day, Women Week. Um, so let me see, let me organize myself here. Um, so this presentation today is uh, slightly different than our previous uh, conversations and I'm really excited also to uh, be in conversation with Dr. Suhad Bishara, who is the, the legal director of uh, Adala. I will uh, introduce her more uh, extensively later um, and uh, continue this conversation about conflict, spaces of conflict, uh, which seems uh, um, incredibly uh, relevant to what we are experiencing today in the world uh, around us, especially in spaces that I'm coming from and where my family is. So this is kind of a lived experience for me and or I'm here, so I should be a bit more modest about it, but uh, I'm following what is happening with my family on a daily basis. Um, so I'd like to actually pick up from where uh, I left off. Uh, in the last uh, lecture, uh, similarly to you, it's kind of it's uh, strange to give back-to-back -back lectures, uh, but I'm also really excited to speak about uh, the, the uh, desert landscapes uh, with you. Uh, but I will start uh, start with uh, explaining why uh, working within conflict. So conflict produces a unique kind of transparency as it exposes the underlying drivers, narratives, and power struggles, uh, along with individuals, uh, individual and collective experiences that shape the built environment. By working at the scale of conflict and addressing both the systems um, that produce it and the people living through it, we attempt to find ways to take on, uh, understand, and embrace complexity. Let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to. Matt, can you help me with a mouse? Thank you. End up on the other screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Um. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. If you look too far to the left, there it'll end up over there. Oh, okay. So, sorry for that. So through conflict, we understand how the big things like colonialism, capitalism, extraction, marginalization, war, meet and influence smaller things like personal narratives of home, trauma, human vulnerability, and vice versa. Right, so the big things are also small things and the small things are also big things. And uh, by embracing conflict, we can uh, cultivate a practice that is itself fluid enough to enter these spaces, to engage with people and uh, the complexity involved uh, by uh, building trust and by finding a way forward. So through this work, um, by not avoiding conflict, but understanding how it works, uh, on many different levels, we do not add. Co we hope that we don't add conflict uh, to conflict, but uh, find a human potential for change. Let me see. 
so today I will uh, like to draw your attention, as I mentioned earlier, to the desert landscape. Um, and again, this event uh, uh, includes a presentation uh, and a conversation uh, with uh, by Suad Bishara uh, from uh, Adala. So I will. We talked about setting the table. So I'm setting the table now for Suhad, and I'm looking forward for her presentation. I might have gone a little bit too far with my presentation, but we'll see to what extent I'm. Um, I'll share information and then move it to Suad. The mouse is really hard to control here. Navigate. Okay. So the desert serves as an interesting example. Um, it's like an open record, preserving traces of past activities and movements due to its uh, arid climate and slow material decay. Even hundreds of years later, these remnants remain visible, offering insight into human history. During a recent visit to the Atacama Desert, I saw um, layers of uh, ancient and recent history imprinted on the landscape as if uh, they had just happened. From the 19th century uh, nitrate mines to the towns destroyed by Pinochet and the pre-colonial uh, Mayan caravans drawing calligraphs uh, on hills to tell stories and share information, uh, the desert's terrain holds a rich record of human experiences. Um, it also exposes the enduring history of territorial enclosures uh, with the violent policies often displacing indigenous communities from their nomadic and semi-nomadic lifestyles in the favor of uh, resource extraction. So these pattern, patterns of dispossession echo throughout history with nomadic lifestyles criminalized for the sake of productivity, capital accumulation, and exploitation. Since our first project with FAST, the Foundation for Achieving Seamless Territory, and yes, it's fast, but it's very slow because our projects take about, I don't think that they have any project that I worked for less than a decade on. Um, so, and most of them are keep on going. Uh, we have looked into to, uh, the desert landscape from the very beginning to shed light on the reality of, uh, for instance, the unrecognized uh, Bedouin villages in Israel. Um, the majority of these villages uh, devoid of uh, official recognition as legal entity by the state, and they endure the absence of uh, basic civic uh, amenities such as water, electricity, or education, but many more other things. And predominantly, they are situated in the southern part of the country within the Nakab or the Negev Desert. They exemplify the struck reality of uh, marginalization and neglect. <clears throat> In 2007, this is an old project, uh, FAST initiated the Archive of Displacement uh, project, aiming to document the, ch and, um, the challenges faced by uh, Bedouin tribes um, and uh, their traditional nomadic roots have been rapidly uh, repurposed and rezoned into different forms of Jewish settlements, such as new towns and lone farms, but many other uh, zones uh, or, um, or programs, uh, including enclosed uh, th that and programs that enclose the nature reserves, uh, monoculture pine forests, uh, military ba bases, and industrial zones. And in the picture. <coughs> In the aerial image, what you can see, and I can imagine Suhad will speak about it more extensively, is the village, uh, the twin villages of Atiyah and Umel Khiran, or what remained of them. Um, <clears throat> the village has been destroyed many times, and you can see some of the remnants of the destruction on the, uh, on the left image. So this is one of the villages that we documented. So the colonization of the desert uprooted many of the Bedouin from their, Bedouins from their livelihood and culture, forcing them to settle in small and densely populated localities, while some managed to resist their displacement into top-down towns. They are subjected to uh, multi-dimensional violence. 
And especially today, as our focus is drawn to Gaza, uh, numerous Bedouin communities, um, in the, again, in the southern region, confront systemic and heightened uh, violence. And this includes militarized raid on their localities and ongoing uh, destruction of their homes and possessions. So our encounter with the desert is coming uh, again and again with our different projects. Uh, and the subjugation of the nomadic people is not a recent phenomena. Uh, and indeed, it is a reoccurring feature of colonial processes uh, evident to other desert regions, such as the Sahara or the Mojave or the Sonoran deserts. Uh, while working on our project Blue, uh, that um, it's a long-term research uh, that uh, examine and study the impact of UN missions on cities, communities, and the environment with uh, a couple of case studies, and one of the case studies took place in the desert, uh, focused on a, U, uh, in, on a United Nations base in Gao, and Gao is situated along the Niger River and <clears throat> on the uh, edge of the Sahara Desert. Uh, Gao is an ancient city that has thrived for millennia, benefited from harmonious coexistence between sedentary and nomadic lifestyles. Uh, and the city population uh, includes pastoralists, desert nomads, fishermen, and farmers. Uh, and it experiences uh, experience seasonal fluctuations. Um, um, and it's actually a really interesting case studies for us to, uh, to understand, especially today when we look at, the cli at climate migration, how, what we can learn from this uh, ancient city. So in some, somehow it's also folding into this class that uh, Sarah mentioned, that I'm, or the Dean mentioned, that I'm teaching at uh, UPD this semester. Um, on, um, it's called uh, Climate Strategies for Climate Migration. But uh, during my visit to the city, to Gao, in 2016, I documented the, the base, the UN base, and engaged in discussion with local herders. Uh, later, I also had the opportunity to interview Musa Aga Sarid, and Musa is the spokesperson of the Movement for the Liberation of Azawad, and Azawad is a non-recognized nation in northern Mali, representing the Tuareg, uh, an ancient a tribe um, uh, or the no, also known as the nomads of the Sahara. So despite their uh, millennia old existence, Musa community, uh, the Tuareg, renowned again as the nomads of the Sahara, persistently grapple for uh, international recognition and self-determination. Uh, the enduring violence they uh, encounter traced, traces its route back to the early days of uh, colonization of Africa. Uh, for example, during one of our uh, visit, and this is something that keeps repeating in our project. So, for instance, in one of my first visits to the UN archive, I found a postcard uh, by, uh, written by a UN clerk uh, saying in a very straightforward language, I just purchased the Sahara Desert, to which account should I uh, charge it? Um, so the desert was was often considered by the um, uh, by a more like uh, modern uh, and uh, um, let's say systems of governance as empty and uh, and therefore these actions can occur. So from my conversation with Musa, uh, I learned that since the beginning of the 20th century, the Tuareg people have rebelled uh, four times. The first rebellion uh, occurred in uh, 1916 against the French colonial rule, uh, spurred by a prolonged drought threatening the Tuareg existence and livelihood. The next rebellion from uh, 62 to 64 followed uh, Mali's independence, driven by dis dissatisfaction with the partition of the Sahara by, co by colonial po uh, powers, leaving the Tuareg to fend for themselves while uh, dispersed uh, across for different nations. So um, another Tuareg revolt took place in uh, early 
1990s. And again, it was uh, uh, sparked by a demand for autonomy amidst of drought, famine, and uh, economic crisis. Uh, so these cycles of um, you know, uh, crisis, uh, drought, etc., often uh, uh, ended up with, um, and, and that was an act of survival by the Tuareg, uh, to, be, uh, to be recognized and to have access to uh, basic resources. Um, and um, the last uh, rebellion, uh, or one of the last, I mean, there is another situation now in Mali, a, a, crisis, a conflict uh, is unfolding at this moment in Mali. Um, um, in 2012, uh, there was another rebellion, uh, and uh, the Libyan government decided to stabilize the region and support the Tuareg, providing them with employment and economic aid. But after the fall of Gaddafi in 2012, sorry, the Tuareg found themselves alone again. Uh, they fled Libya um, south to the Sahara and, est and established the movement for the liberation of Azawad. Um, and as they moved into Mali together with other militarized organization to capture land, they, they were halted. They the French army and the UN and a UN re resolution came right after, uh, and so the beginning of a new mission uh, in Mali started. And this was the mission that we were uh, trying to document the uh, the way the beginning of a UN mission unfolds in that space. Um, the stability of, however, didn't last long, and Mali is facing now another militarized coup, uh, forcing people to move again south to Mauritania. And actually, this is the case study of our class, the, one of the case studies that we are looking in a, our class on uh, climate, uh, on uh, special strategies for climate migration. So when talking with Musa, he spoke passionately about desert cities. According to him, desert cities are horizontal. They submerge, uh, submerge uh, with the landscape. And he said that I was born and raised in a tent made of old clothes. And then he continued, a tent is part of nature, and the outdoor is my home. The desert is a flat construct, and our cities have no limits. They embrace this uh, vastness and flatness. Uh, we believe that capitalist cities and European cities are mostly vertical, dense, and tall, with tall buildings. For us, physical, uh, this physical structure manifests inequality. Our desert cities will uh, embody justice and equality in their horizontal shape. They will be able to shrink and exp uh, expand flexibly to allow access for all. His ideas challenge the traditional understanding of a special design discipline and as well as concepts of uh, justice, temporality, and materiality, and uh, the future along with our values and uh, lifestyles. So for me, it was really interesting to encounter the desert because it offers sort of a, a mirror or a reflection that on our lifestyle that is really hard to get if you don't have this uh, almost like a counter narrative, right? Um, I'll s skip this. Uh, um, slides. So moving back to the uh, Negev or the Nakab Desert, uh, before the, uh, even before the establishment of Israel in 1948, the Nakab or the Negev, which covers about 60% of the country territory, became a space of national fixation, a space of experimentation where Jewish national resurrection and modernity converged. Following calls to the, uh, in the early 1940s to make the desert bloom, scientists, military, and political leaders artists and architects travel south to the desert to experiment with uh, its settlement and uh, domestication, conquering, controlling, and trans uh, transitioning its ecology to make it simultaneously more green and fertile, more industrialized, mined and settled, and less Arab. Colonizing the desert was a prominent goal of the uh, Zionist uh, project. In 1937, the British uh, Peel Commission, for example, uh, an entity formed uh, to investigate unrest in the mandatory Palestine, announced a plan to partition the territory into three uh, bodies to be governed independently by Jewish, Arab, and British leaders. As a result, the uh, uh, 
uh, entirety of the Nagab uh, or the Negev region. Nakab is the name of the desert in Arabic and Negev is the name of the desert in Hebrew. Um, so uh, it was uh, placed under Arab rule and Jewish individuals and organizations were uh, restricted from uh, acquiring any land in the desert. Um, regardless, the non-for-profit uh, Jewish Agency for Palestine developed a strategic plan to purchase and settle the desert, illegally establishing Jewish settlements to test the response of the British colonial institutions to uh, Jewish expansion and to conduct a scientific study on the climatological, water, soil, and agricultural pot potentialities of the desert. Uh, with the settlements uh, plan, uh, as, or while the set settlement plan was uh, being developed in February 1937, a small company called Mekorot uh, was listed in the corporate uh, registry of the British Mandate uh, government, and the company primary primary goal was to implement and perform all the works and deeds needed for finding, collecting, selling, delivering, measuring, distributing, and producing water. So the settle settling of the desert was contingent upon uh, having access to water. Sorry. Can I go backward? OK, yeah, I think it works. So. Inspired by uh, the diversion of the Colorado, sorry, I'm trying to struggle at the same time with the mouse. It doesn't really listening to me, or we don't go along very well. Anyway, so inspired by the uh, diversion of the Colorado River to uh, water the arid land of California and Arizona, Simcha uh, Blas, the founder of Mekorot, and its chief engineer who also invented the drip irrigation, drew up a plan for the uh, first modern uh, aqueduct to bring water from the Jordan River in the north of the country south into the Negev. Okay. So the project uh, first pipes were installed in 1947 and were inaugurated with public installation, exhibitions, and celebration. And the, the water project resulted not only in the expansion of settlements and thereafter um, Set, sorry, not, it's resulted not only by the expansion of settlements, but eventually helped to influence a change to the partition of uh, Palestine. So the 1947 UN partition plan set out the same year, considered the, Nag the Negev a part of the Jewish state now. So the settlements uh, of the desert, bringing water to the desert and settling it really changed the border of uh, Israel. So after the establishment of Israel, the Negev desert continued to, um, to become a space from which the modern project of Israel could be understood and linked to a broader narrative of redemption, a narrative that is not foreign to the uh, colonial settler. For example, in the, in the desert region of the US, religious uh, stream settled the arid land of Arizona, framing their actions as uh, the redemption of New Zion. In, in 1833, when uh, Joseph Smith proposed his uh, city of Zion plan, he envisioned it as, a, as the ideal blueprint for the establishing a, of an utopian community, a new Jerusalem in the American West. Um, and by the time Salt Lake City was established under a, a big ham young, um, a young sorry, the rigid uh, grid plan of the city of Zion has become a hallmark of Mormon town design in uh, extreme contrast with the natural um, features of the desert landscape. So the last thing that I would like to mention before moving to Suhad. Um, so after, uh, I want to tell you a story because we always try to move from personal narrative to understanding how the system works. So during a, a project that we exhibited at the, uh, in, at the Biennale, the, inter, the 2020, 
2022 uh, International Biennale in Rotterdam, um, we looked at the wooden hut of David Ben-Gurion in, in Sdebuker. So after retiring with his wife to a small wooden hut in Kibbutz Sdebuker in the Negev, David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, noted in his memoir that the Negev has given him time and uh, respect uh, and perspective to look back on Israel's modern redemption. He continued, the Negev, Bernas, is blessing in the sky, and ask what, what are the treasures that the sand conceal. We must focus attention on the systemic uh, investigation of forces that can make uh, the Negev thrive. For without the settlement of this region, we simply don't have the elbow room to make Israel economically independent and military secure. We can attain it by moving a good segment of the population uh, here and cultivate the land. However, the uh, settlement of the Negev desert and the attempts to make it bloom, fertile and uh, productive have often been intertwined with the removal of the indigenous population and have uh, conflicted uh, with the natural features and ecology of the desert. So uh, my presentation ends here. Um, and uh, I'd like to introduce now uh, Suhad Bishara, Dr. Suhad Bishara. Suhad is the legal director and director of uh, the Land and Planning uh, Rights Unit uh, in Adala. And Adala is an independent human rights organization uh, that uh, is based in uh, uh, Israel. Um, it's a, a legal center. Uh, she has worked with Adala since 2001. Uh, she spe specializes in land and planning rights and uh, more than 23 uh, years of, and has more than 23 years of experience litigating uh, cases before the Israeli Supreme Court. Uh, she served as a lead lawyer in major human rights cases regarding Palestinian citizens of Israel and international uh, humanitarian law cases concerning Palestinian in the 1967 occupied territory before the Israeli Supreme Court. Uh, previously, she served as a legal consultant uh, at the Association of 40, uh, the Arab Steering Committee for Urban Planning in the Galil Society, and the uh, Hotline for Battered Women. Suad is also uh, the founder of Kayan, a feminist organization, and she has she received her uh, uh, law uh, degree, the Bachelor of from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, the Masters uh, in Public uh, Service Law from uh, NYU uh, School of Law, and her PhD from uh, King's College uh, School of Law in London. She was uh, also a Palestine and Law Fellow at Columbia University uh, Law School. I'm really excited to have you join us, Suad. Um, I remember you saying I always uh, uh, I, I win the narrative, but I lose the case. So, <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I let yeah, you. Well, thank take you, over. Mafit. Um, yeah, but this is the challenging part, I guess, of our work <laughs> as human rights uh, lawyers and, and activists. Um, Again, th thank you, Malkit, for inviting me uh, to have this conversation today. Uh, it's an honor for me to be with you uh, via Zoom. Uh, I will start by uh, giving uh, <clears throat> a very brief overview to contextualize what and why we see the current policies in the Naqab because it's not a problem of the Bedouin in the Naqab, it's not a problem of the Naqab as a geographic area, it's a wider uh, context that we need uh, to understand, to fully comprehend uh, what is uh, happening. So basically with the establishment uh, of the state, Israel translated uh, Jewish identity into political difference uh, and racial distinction. A law in the new state became constitutive of political, spatial, and territorial racial formations and an organic site of settler colonial realization for the state and a Zionist uh, organizations, uh, which took part and still integral part 
in developing the land uh, in Israel. So since its establishment in 48, Israeli jurisdiction has succeeded in maintaining a Jewish racial uh, territoriality and spatial domination that transcended time and historical events and legal uh, uh, frameworks. This was uh, uh, the case during the military regime imposed on the Palestinian citizens in Israel between 48 uh, and 66, administered under martial law. This was the case with the end of the military regime an era administered by civil law. And this is the case after what came to be known as the constitutional revolution in Israel in the mid 90s up until today. So the realization of territorial formations have three main uh, pillars. And, and many scholars have written about this, including Kidar, Sharat, Yiftahel, and many others. Uh, so, so three main uh, pillars. Uh, Historically, up until now, and I will zoom in later to, to the Naqab and some specific cases, disposition of Palestinians. For most part, Israel's colonial territoriality it confronted a pre-existing legal regime that produced uh, the title by registration. This started during the Ottoman Empire, and then the British uh, continued with their reforms and so on. So laws were enacted Israeli laws, to transfer Palestinian ownership in land to the state of Israel. This including absentee property law that was enacted in 1950, targeting Palestinian refugees' properties, a land acquisition law enacted in 53, targeting internally displaced people, Palestinian citizens of the state, displaced in their uh, homeland, uprooted from their villages. So the result, of these massive and arbitrary confiscation is that about 93% of the land in Israel is administered under state authority called the Israeli Land Administration. The vast majority are state lands. Uh, about 13% are owned by the Jewish uh, National uh, Fund. The second displacement of uh, Palestinians from their homes and villages to control more land for Jewish settlement or development uh, induced displacement in many cases, including in the Naqab. And in my next comment, I will zoom in a little bit uh, to talk about uh, Naqab and how this is manifested there nowadays. The third, uh, which is uh, uh, very important, Jewish collectivity, that is integral and inherent part of the definition of the state as a Jewish state. This is given that the disposition of the Palestinians alone is insufficient uh, as a means of guaranteeing Jewish spatial uh, domination. Now here we are talking about a, a, a interwoven connection between the state organizations, state authorities and Zionist organizations in administering public land. Jewish collectivity attained the status of a legal value uh, in the territory. Uh, Jewish collective ownership as a value to preserve land for the benefit of the Jewish people, which means a ban on sale for foreigners. I will not get into the details of that because we don't have a uh, time. Segregation as a mode of territorial domination, um, known as the admissions committee's laws. There are many techniques uh, that I will not be able to go uh, into them, how segregation is maintained for most part of uh, the territory of, of Israel. Uh, Israel nation state of the Jewish people uh, uh, enacted in 2018. Uh, uh, basically uh, states uh, that the state views the development of Jewish settlement as a national value and will act to encourage and promote its establishment. Uh, one last comment in this regard is that like the policy and legal assumption analyzing Jewish settlement is that it is inherently uh, inclusive, meaning segregation in many localities in, in Israel. <clears throat> and this is the working legal assumption in the Supreme Court decision in its ruling, rejecting the petition, challenging, challenging the constitutionality of the nation, a state basically known as the Hasuna case. 
I want to zoom in uh, a little bit to uh, the Naqab. Uh, uh, so the displacement of Palestinian citizens, a, a fundamental component of Jewish territorial domination, is currently uh, at its most intensive in the Naqab, uh, Negev uh, area, the southern of uh, Israel. So like, that, like the rest of the Palestinian people in mandatory Palestine, the Bedouin tribes of the Naqab exercise expulsion, displacement, and loss during and after the Nakba in, in 48. And on the eve of the Nakba, some 91,000 people were living in the Naqab. Uh, <clears throat> most of these residents were expelled to Gaza, Jordan, and only 12% of the original Bedouin population remained in the Naqab, later uh, received Israeli citizenship and became citizens of the state of Israel. So one of the first measures taken by uh, uh, the state authorities in the early 50s was to forcibly transfer and concentrate those who remained of the Bedouin tribes in the southern and western Naqab, <coughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, joined by uh, tribes that uh, who were there. Uh, and the state relocated these and concentrated them in an enclosed area in the northern uh, Naqab known as the fence or the siage area in Arabic. Uh, <coughs> at the order of the military commander of uh, the southern front uh, at that time. Uh, so, so the outcome was the concentration of all Bedouin tribes uh, that remained uh, after the Nakba within a narrow pocket of land, uh, very adjacent to the, the Green Line, the border with the uh, West Bank, South Hebron Hills, uh, to be more specific. Uh, and, and those who were displaced were not and still never allowed to return to their uh, land. So in the 1950s, the government uh, began the process of drafting several plans to deal with the, what was perceived and still, unfortunately, the problem of the remaining Bedouins living in the Naqab, uh, which shared a common objective of minimizing the area of land uh, they uh, inhabited. So the solution was to concentrate the Bedouin community in a number of uh, state-built townships, uh, what is known to be a forced urbanization, in order to change the community's character, uh, preserve uh, areas uh, designated for Jewish settlement uh, at the various stages, uh, exercise monitoring and control, prevent territorial continuity uh, of Arab Palestinian uh, uh, Bedouin populations and prevent contact uh, on both sides of uh, the Green Line uh, uh, and, and uh, borders. These uh, are set in uh, archival, these goals we found in archival documents um, uh, drafted back uh, during the military regime in 1958. Um, now, by the 1990s, seven townships were established. Later on, uh, 11 uh, Bedouin ta towns and villages were additionally uh, recognized. And the major consequence of this uh, uh, construction and recognition was that uh, any other Bedouin village uh, doomed to be illegal. Uh, anyone lived outside of these uh, planned, government planned townships uh, was considered uh, illegal. The illegality was primarily affected through zoning laws, uh, master planning, um, planning and building law, of course, which established a highly centralized uh, decision-making process and planning process and, and, and zoning of land uh, areas. It operated alongside a restrictive land planning policy and design, as well as the systematic designation of the land on which Bedouin villages stand as non-residential. The, the land in 
uh, is, is commonly zoned for military industrial areas, green areas, uh, Jewish towns, roads, uh, forestation purposes, and, and uh, much more. So this rigid zoning policy is premised on the logic of uh, eliminatory displacement and combined with disputes over Bedouin land ownership uh, has enabled the Israeli state authorities to portray these villages collectively known as the unrecognized villages as having been built illegally by Bedouins trespassing uh, and intruding uh, state land, public domains. Uh, and as, as Malkit mentioned, being unrecognized means, uh, and we're talking about an estimation of 90,000 citizens residing in these uh, uh, 35 villages, uh, they don't appear on an official map. Uh, they receive uh, uh, no municipal funding, lack system of local government, absence of master planning. Uh, um, all construction is prohibited. Uh, this is why we see a lot of demolitions there. Um, poor uh, water connections, no electricity, and so on and so on. So. Uh, in, in 2007, the Israeli government decided to establish a special committee to examine uh, and issue recommendations uh, to steer state policy uh, for the issue of how do we regulate Bedouin settlements in the Naqab, uh, headed by uh, retired Justice uh, Goldberg by then. Uh, he's a retired Supreme Court justice. Uh, and the, in, in its concluding report, the committee suggested, and I'm quoting, the forced movement of some of the Bedouin tribes in, to the fence area should not be ignored. It cannot be said that the tribes that were already there or those that were transferred uh, invaded the fence area, even if over the years they have illegally extended their uh, border in the area beyond the original land boundaries. Of course, uh, the intention here is that you know, families expand, tribes expand, and so on. So despite this finding the committee of the committee, the state authorities continues to argue that these communities trespass state land. Now, I want to zoom in a little bit more uh, through a story of a case that I've litigated for over a decade, almost 15 years. Uh, <clears throat> to give you a, a, a more clear sense of how the system works, how law works, how law interacts with zoning and master planning. Um, so it's, it's the village of Amal Hiran, and the residents of Amal Hiran, it's an unrecognized village, were repeatedly uh, targeted for eviction and displacement from their tribal land by Israeli authorities between the years 48 and 56, uh, when the Israeli uh, regional military government displaced the entire tribe to the area of Wadi Atir, where uh, some of them continue to live on their present day and their ancestral land were uh, uh, located as part of the agricultural land for kibbutz Shuval, a uh, Jewish kibbutz that was established uh, decades uh, ago. In 2001, a governmental decision was made to establish a Jewish town in the exact same location of uh, Emil Hiran, the Jewish town under the governmental decision was and is called Hiram. Uh, and this is when planning and law became very handy. Uh, urban master plan was uh, drawn for the new town, uh, designation, designating the whole village for uh, destruction. Probably <laughs> zoom back a little bit for, for one or two minutes. Um, I mean, I mean, this is a map of the jurisdictional division between uh, local authorities in Israel, that's like cities, uh, smaller towns, regional councils. Uh, the the um, uh, the, the blue color is uh, designations for Jewish local authorities, 
or predominantly uh, Jewish. The reddish ones are uh, Arab uh, localities. It's mainly uh, villages and towns that survived the Nakba. Uh, and this, uh, these areas are mixed cities like Haifa, Akka, Tel Aviv, Yafa. Uh, and uh, like there are five or six cities that are considered under the uh, Israeli Bureau of Statistics as um, a mixed. Uh, this is a map of the unrecognized uh, villages as of uh, today. These are <clears throat> archival maps that we found in the army archives, where the first plans to, uh, I, I call it the second phase of displacement, uh, were uh, drawn, uh, where they locate, this is the Siage area, they locate the Bedouin tribes that those who were there prior to the uh, Nakba and those who were displaced. And these are arrows uh, basically uh, <clears throat> planning or designing the townships and where everyone should uh, be moved. This is another form of that um, map. So this is Emil Hiran uh, that I started uh, uh, speaking about. And uh, this is basically the master plan. Now, before I continue, looking at this master plan, and if you want to be optimistic, you say, OK, this is amazing. This is a village here that was, uh, um, that was established during the military regime in 1956. They were unrecognized. And now there's a master plan designates the area as residential. And this is good news. Uh, however, this is not how uh, the, the scenario that was uh, planned in this uh, master plan, because the houses of Emil Hiran that we see here underneath in the background were designated uh, for uh, destruction to empty this whole area completely for uh, the new residents uh, to come uh, to the area. Again, this was uh, designed uh, the initial decision of the Israeli government was to establish a Jewish uh, town uh, called Tehran in this uh, area. Um, okay. Uh, how do I? Okay, I'll stop sharing now. Um, so uh, again, this is where master planning, as, as we have seen in, in the map, and law becomes uh, very uh, handy. Uh, so parallel to the planning process, two legal procedures were initiated by state authorities. The first was demolition orders, arguing that the residents uh, build their homes without permits. And again, the permit can be uh, granted by uh, state authorities, state authorities uh, are the uh, ones who uh, can uh, uh, designate the area as residential, plan it as they wish, and so on. Uh, so here to make uh, a long story short, the court approved the demolition, which meant that although the residents were moved to live there by state authorities, uh, they were not permitted to build houses or homes to shelter uh, their families. It's an extreme act of dehumanization. The second uh, legal procedure uh, that, that was initiated by the state was eviction lawsuits. Uh, and the state argued here that the residents of Emil Hiran trespassed state property without uh, permission. Um, as I said, the litigation took uh, around 15 years. And at the beginning, uh, the residents, and I have to say myself, <laughs> believed that all we have to do to win the case is to convince the court that the residents are not trespassers, meaning that they were forcibly displaced to live in this area by the military governor. And they have been living there for over uh, five uh, decades. And we really, truly believed that this is the scenario, if we manage to prove that they are not space trespassers. And luckily, we did. We did a huge archival uh, research, and we managed to put our hands on an archival document that was 
confidential back then, telling the story. It was an internal uh, document within the government uh, back uh, then. Uh, so we did manage to convince the court uh, that they are not trespassers. Um, and we, uh, the document revealed the, the story as told by the residents of Emil Hiran, refuted the theory of trespassing argued by the state. And the court said, you are right. It's not really accurate, the least to say, of the state to uh, argue that they are trespassers. They know better than that. They know the history and they know that they brought them to live in that area. Yet, the court ruled that the state authorities had acted in a reasonable and proportionate manner and had not infringed the residents' uh, rights. And thus, the state authorities can evict the residents of Emil Hiran, demolish the village, and establish the town of Hiran over uh, uh, their uh, ruins. Uh, as I often describe the case, and as I, uh, as as Malkit mentioned, we, we won the narrative and and still lost uh, the case. In other words, no matter what, the result is inevitable. There is something more to it than strong constitutional arguments and the ability to uh, 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 to bring evidence to tell your story, the facts as you've experienced them with your uh, uh, history. So I, I don't have time to walk you through the legal techniques of the ruling, but the underlying logic was that the state gave you the permission to live there over five decades, and the state can take away that permission, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of you being a citizen, which means, in other words, that the moment the master plan was put forward, and the moment the governmental decision to establish a Jewish town was uh, 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 drafted, translated again into a master plan, the whole history disappeared. Your, your connection to the land, your history, the circumstances, how you got there, completely disappeared and had uh, no meaning. No factually, no legally, uh, not in terms of uh, how do I uh, uh, plan and zone an area, to whom, to benefit who, and all vanished. And, and your history starts with the decision to establish a Jewish town, with the planning uh, of that town, with the designation of your house for demolition, and this is where everything starts. And everything before that, just uh, vanishes. Uh, <clears throat> now, this also resonates with uh, what I mentioned earlier regarding Jewish collectivity, segregation, and so on, because the only solution offered to the residents of Emil Hiran is to move to live in the Bedouin, one of the townships that were established in the 80s, called uh, uh, Hura. Uh, <clears throat> so basically, when the residents are good as citizens, who were moved to the area by state authorities, uh, and especially that the area is designated now as residential, and it would be unconstitutional to evict them, to bring Jewish citizens uh, to live on the ruins of their villages. And we are talking about public resource because it's, it's, a, it's a land that registered under the, the tenure of the state of Israel. Then the court said it is not unconstitutional because the state committed to open the bids in Hiran for all citizens equi equally, which later manipulated to avoid uh, that in the bids uh, uh, published by the ILA. But this is, again, a different uh, uh, story and, and maneuvering uh, the system differently. What is important to note here is that uh, neither the state authorities uh, uh, nor the court jurisprudence were willing or able to perceive the space as a common space. They could not perceive it as a shared one. They could not perceive it uh, 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 with equal uh, citizenship. And, and the master planning and the law function in a way to, to create this conflict, to create this dispute, uh, and to resolve it in, in only one way. And there's no other way. Um, uh, 
Uh, and and here again, speaking of, of of Women's Day, gender became also part of of, of defining difference between the residents of Emil Hiran and the future residents of, of uh, Hiran uh, by the state. And this is also to legitimize authority to evict. Uh, uh, Bedouin and, and Jewish women became the new frontiers by which the imagined space is seen, and they became the, the center in that space to protect it from uh, uh, heterogeneity, to keep it as uh, uh, homogeneous as, as possible. Uh, <clears throat> There are honestly many la colonial layers to unfold here, uh, but we don't have the time for that uh, today. Uh, but the state, generally speaking, drew on the cultural uh, characterization of, of the Bedouin to make it uh, 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 claim that the residents should be evicted, arguing that the planned new town of Hiran would be incompatible with Bedouin culture. Uh, Although we argued on behalf of, of the community in Milhiran, we are very happy with the plan. Uh, we're willing to live there as is. We're willing to live there with anyone who uh, is, is, is welcome to come. Uh, but the state claimed that, in principle, it does not want to establish a separate Bedouin neighborhood within the town in a manner that would disrupt the town's overall character. The state argued that the master plan for the new town had been designed to fulfill the needs of the general public. Again, the big question is who is the general uh, public? Definitely, this does not include the residents of Emil Hiran, and obviously in reference to the Jewish uh, population, as opposed to the particular and assumably different uh, requirements for the Bedouin uh, community. Uh, so the Bedouin community cannot meet the criteria of, of general public, and this is how uh, the law, the master planning, and the zoning of, of, of the area all played hand in hand to uh, make a very specific uh, dispute, dispute, a legal one, um, a zoning one that is uh, resolved uh, only uh, in one way uh, uh, where the Jewish spatial domination uh, superseded any uh, other uh, legal or factual argument uh, <clears throat> in, in this regard. So uh, it is important to note uh, that um, Israeli law generally, and this is the case here, of course, uh, so, never sought to establish an Israeli collective nationality. Uh, relying instead on its definition as uh, a Jewish. Uh, the residents of Emil Hiran, as an example, are inherently distinct and different. Uh, and this definition created an immediate political and civic distinction between Jewish and Palestinian citizens of Israel, based or you know, ethnic, racial, uh, national identity, regardless how you want to define it. Um, and this distinct characteristic sorry, categorization uh, has had critical ramifications that shaped policies, laws, and constitutional framework and spatial design in Israel. And the result of that is what we have seen in Amr Hiran uh, as an example uh, in their today-to-day -day life, uh, the insecurity of tenure uh, uh, and, and the unknown future. Uh, for now, Amr Hiran still exists. There have been many uh, attempts and uh, to evict the village. Um, uh, some of the houses were demolished. Unfortunately, one resident uh, and one police officer uh, lost their life in one of these uh, demolition uh, uh, stages. Um, but the future of the village is unknown. What happened parallel to that is the infrastructure for uh, Hiran, the new town, is uh, uh, being uh, uh, built, uh, roads paved, uh, and the bids uh, uh, were published um, like two years ago uh, for the public. Uh, to come and uh, lease uh, plots of land and build their homes. However, uh, these were manipulated in a way to uh, prevent 
uh, ML Hiran residents to apply for these uh, residents and at, for these uh, plots. And this is how so far it's kept as clean as possible of uh, any Bedouin potential uh, residents of the new uh, uh, town. Um, I think, uh, Malkit, I will um, uh, stop here. Um, or so. maybe to share one more uh, slide in two minutes. Um, let's see. Where I'm... Okay. Uh, this is basically how the Naqab looks like uh, zooming in uh, to that area uh, today. Uh, during the Nakba, all of the Biulu areas became, uh, after the Nakba, uh, predominantly Jewish. The fence area where the Bedouin communities were concentrated, the uh, reddish spots here are the recognized Bedouin uh, townships and, and villages. Uh, the grayish area here is where most of the unrecognized villages uh, are uh, located, and the aim is to concentrate them into these reddish uh, areas. So we'll have more blue areas uh, in this small part of, of uh, the Naqab uh, area, extending blue as much as, as you can. This is, this is the aim of the policy. Um, So I think just given time, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, so we can open it up to questions from. Oh, sorry. Is it on? Uh, just we have about 15 minutes left. So if anyone has questions in the audience, um, we can start there. I concerned, and, and I, I want to thank you, Suhad, for sharing that um, complicated legal story with us. I can just imagine how it's consumed you. But I guess um, it's a very basic question when dealing with people in the desert and the conflict in the desert of um, uh, entities that are nomadic. Um, how do you even organize those populations for offering some form of legal framework? Because so much of our legal um, grounding is literally grounded in property and sort of the negotiation of individual property and collective areas as defined in a, in a sort of um, regulated way. And so how do, it's a very basic question, but I think that it's, it's um, uh, at the basis of the challenge that Malki put in front of us of the desert and the nomadic people as a sort of entity at all. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, thank you. It is a very important uh, question. Uh, uh, um, um, the Bedouins in the Naqab for uh, a very long time uh, stopped being nomadic and moved to semi-nomadic, uh, meaning they have a location where they lived, and they have a location uh, where they seasonally agriculture and move there back and forth. So they were semi-nomadic in this uh, sense. And later on, they became less and less even semi-nomadic. Semi, uh, uh, we uh, know, and a lot has been written about this, Kidar, uh, Yiftah El, Ahmed Amara, and much more, many more. Uh, that uh, uh, and there are archival documents uh, that reveal that uh, uh, although the Ottoman and the British land registration system uh, did not get to the Naqab for many reasons, uh, 
uh, they recognized and they respected the tribal uh, ownership over the ancestral tribal lands. They cultivated these lands uh, for decades and for generations. And in fact, uh, during the uh, British mandate, um, Jewish individuals and Zionist organizations bought some land from Bedouin tribes. These transactions are not huge in scope, but these transactions were recognized by the British mandate and by the Israeli authorities. Once the land got to Jewish hands, it was immediately recognized. Uh, however, uh, this does not uh, work when we are talking about uh, Bedouin uh, claiming a title for their ancestral lands. Uh, and this is a, a huge um, issue in the Naqal. Uh, that is resolved only in one way. Uh, these so, disputes go to the court, and, and the court uh, does not recognize. So this is how people ending up losing their ancestral lands. No, that's helpful. But I, I wonder if Malki can also jump in with the Mali example of understanding sort of how these desert spaces, which seemingly have no definition, how they get defined in terms of conflict in a, in a broad way. I think that's a very helpful answer with that specifics. And then I wonder, in your work, how you would answer that. I think I was able to understand, actually, what I've seen in northern Mali, because I, under, uh, I, I know the, the, the Negev. I know the case of the Negev. Um, and uh, there are semi-nomadic tribes also there that have been live harmoniously with uh, sedentary communities and they migrated seasonally uh, but still they always migrated on the same routes and they have the spaces where they had their water, they had their agriculture land the, the, or the spaces where um, um, the herds used to uh, graze uh, so the, it's a system that is fluid and flexible that is not recognized by our tools as you know like the urban planning the master plan where everything is uh, designed for basically extraction of taxes right and uh, organization of uh, controlling of society um, and their uh, lifestyle is completely contradicting this, uh, this way of uh, thinking and organizing our space. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there is no ownership because there is a very, uh, um, let's say, uh, ancient and strict, uh, and also strict way in which the zones were allocated and organized among the tribes. So it's very similar to uh, the Negev. What you see in the Negev uh, is that um, the Bedouin uh, tribes have been also um, constrained to uh, their, the spaces around, have, uh, around them. Uh, and there's the spaces of um, the space where they used to uh, to move around has been restricted to a very small area that uh, uh, made it actually also forced them to to settle in a way that is completely I find it inhumane. It's very difficult. This uh, the localities of the Bedouins uh, in the Negev are very uh, difficult uh, localities because the roof is not a roof. Now we've seen with what is happening in the war in Gaza. They don't have sheltered rooms. They are being also uh, targeted. Uh, they are also actually. I, I don't want. If we, I don't know if we should open that. But they also um, really um, see their faith as part of the Jewish state faith. They serve in the army. They have been kidnapped <laughs> together with. Uh, so it's uh, it's really strange. Um, uh, situation that they are finding themselves uh, in, and uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I will leave it at this. I don't know, Suad, so maybe you want to add something to that? Let's see if there are any more questions. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, keep in mind that uh, all of these uh, res registration uh, procedures and, and tenure type of ownership is, is yeah, developed along colonialism. 
uh, and it only serves uh, colonial uh, mechanisms. Uh, and it's it's not only uh, in, in southern Israel, it's, it's all over. It was in, in the US, in, in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and so on. Uh, I mean, each country developed in a different way, uh, different techniques, and resolved and trying to resolve issues in different manners. Uh, however, uh, the, the strong notion of Jewish collectivity in Israel mandates uh, all of these policies, including uh, the non-recognition of, uh, of a Bedouin uh, tenure over their ancestral land. And there are taxation uh, books uh, that, uh, <clears throat> that, that the British mandate conducted, and uh, assumably it should uh, prove uh, ownership over land, but these are not recognized under Israeli uh, law and judicial system. So there is uh, <clears throat> a clear interest in this regard uh, drawn from the definition of collectivity uh, in Israel and to whom uh, these lands should be reserved. So um, if we lived in a better world where someone or, or, or if a consensus about the existence of um, intangible heritage to preserve because they have a, like a, a way of living which is uh, worth it to be preserved, um, who, would be, who would be the authority to enact such a protection? Uh, OK, uh, it's a complex uh, question, I have to say, uh, because uh, there is the uh, framework of the um, UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of the Indigenous People which sets a framework for uh, some countries. Um, some started with uh, <clears throat> some kind of framework of recognizing indigenous title, uh, self-management, um, uh, and so on, even before the declaration, the UN declaration. However, the declaration now is perceived as the framework by which uh, indigenous communities and states, colonial, post-colonial, whatever you want to call it, uh, states should manage the conflict and the issues with uh, <clears throat> indigenous or natives, I would like to call it more than indigenous, because indigeneity is a creation of the colonial world. But, uh, <clears throat> and indeed, it is a very important development in terms of international law, uh, trying to create some space of um, uh, rights uh, as indigenous people or native communities or minorities would like to uh, see themselves uh, in. Uh, but um, if I want to come back to the Bedouins in the Naqab, um, I want to uh, say a few things. One is that the declaration uh, lives well with the colonial system. Uh, it does not contest it. Uh, it aspires to create, um, I would even say, a small bubble of sort of normality within a much bigger disturbed colonial and settler colonial polity. Uh, and this is not working for many indigenous communities, and there have been a lot of scholarly critical writing about uh, the implementation of such a framework in, in many uh, uh, countries all over the, the world that have native uh, communities and minorities. Um, now, coming back to uh, the Naqab, uh, several things. First, the framing of the system. And here, the, in the last decade, there have been many scholars, uh, politicians, uh, activists, uh, um, that uh, developed or centralized the critical uh, discourse that analyzed Israel as a settler uh, colonial uh, regime, aiming for uh, 
uh, geodemographic and political uh, hegemony, uh, which was also and is being constitutionalized. Uh, and this is the nature of, of the regime uh, and the way it translated its definition as, as a Jewish uh, uh, state. And I mentioned the nation state law and so on. The second crucial thing here is the realization that one of the most important strategies of, of, of Israel dealing with the Palestinian people generally, including the citizens of Israel, is geographical and legal division and fragmentation. The third uh, is the, the effective role of the Israeli judicial system uh, in the political space of, of the regime uh, and its strategic goals since the Nakba. Uh, during and after until today. Uh, and of course, we need to realize the role of the Israeli judicial system uh, as it's the primary space where all of these rights are shaped or violated. Yeah. Uh, a fourth critical point here is, is the reading of Israeli law and the judiciary indicate that uh, in the context of Israeli geopolitical strategies, uh, political and legal action cannot be separated. Uh, the law and the judicial system interact uh, uh, within it go to the heart of the political action. Um, and, and through this geopolitical strategies and techniques, the judiciary, among many other strategies, is, is harshening the cultural distinctiveness, which is the core of, of the UN declaration of the Bedouins in particular, in order to legitimize the rationalized and disposition of the land, evictions, as we have seen in the case of, of Emil Hiran uh, that I uh, mentioned earlier. And, and the fifth uh, issue here is that the Bedouin are part of the Palestinian people. Uh, we're not talking about a, a minority like in, in most cases, and the fate of their future is connected to the fate of the Palestinian people, the wider uh, uh, community of Palestinian citizens uh, of the state. And by the way, the claim was tested for the first time before the Israeli court in 2015, and the court said, no UN declaration, it does not really uh, uh, bind Israel in any way, and, uh, and, and, and Israel and the, the court refused to discuss any legal arguments in this uh, manner. So under these circumstances, adopting any framework of indigeneity for the Bedouin community, whether through the declaration or any other uh, uh, framework, risks basically shifting the discussion over political resolution to the level of distortion of, of the past and the current grievances. It does not fully comprehend why this is happening in the Naqab. This is not a Bedouin problem. This is a problem that resonates to all citizens of Israel and, and uh, Palestinians and Jewish, by the way, and wider to the Palestinian uh, 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 people. And, and we cannot go into self-fragmentation strategies uh, in this regard. It will only entrench the, the colonial uh, taxes, not to mention the issue of, of narrative uh, uh, who was there first, whether uh, Israel will recognize uh, Bedouins, even if I want to go to that framework as natives, what does that mean to the uh, Jewish Zionist narrative, and so on. So, so a lot of things play into hand here um, that makes me a bit cautious uh, about uh, consuming uh, any framework of indigeneity in uh, uh, and, and this regard. Thank you. I think we should. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a good place to stop. Um, thank you both, Malkit and Suhad, for speaking with us um, and for really helping us understand a bit more kind of the intersection with spatial planning policies, um, legal frameworks, and how that impacts demolition and displacement. It was really, really interesting. Thank you.